wasn't that long ago that I was hobbling up here on crutches and wearing a lovely walking boot that my wife Jackie thought looked so stylish that she decided to break her foot so she could wear one too. She looked better in it than I did. She, she wore it really well. She made that boot work. And I want to say hello also to those who are joining us on the live stream, on Facebook, on YouTube. Welcome. It's good for all of us to be together, however we are together. It's good that we are here, that I'm here in the same room as you. We're back. And that is a good thing. Uh, it was a month ago that I last preached here. And for those of you who are not aware, uh, Jackie and I, my wife and I, were in the U.S. for the memorial service for Jackie's mom. And she went home to be with Jesus on May 11th. And the memorial service was both sad and beautiful. That's the both and that we experience. Joy and pain, sorrow and laughter coexist in our lives. And as we were back, coming back on the plane from the U.S., I took some pictures out of the window of the plane. These are those pictures. And they symbolize for me what we have been experiencing. Because we see underneath the clouds, we see darkness, we see haze, we see rain, we see gloomy, we are grieving, and it is sad. We are sad for our loss. And at the same time, there is light above the clouds. And the light is even tearing through the clouds and illuminating what's below in the picture on the right. You see beams of light tearing through and making it to the ground. And we grieve, but not as those who have no hope. We have a living hope. Jesus is our living hope. He has conquered death, and he is the light of the world. And he brings hope with him into our hearts. We've been experiencing that. And he said, in this world you will have trouble, but be encouraged because I have overcome the world. We're experiencing that. We're experiencing the trouble. It's been a really rough last month. It's been a really rough last year, but God is in the midst of it, and we are experiencing being upheld by his everlasting arms as we grieve. So you have all been a part of that with your prayers. Thank you. God is listening. God is acting. We experience it. We missed you. But we're glad that you could be with us through prayer. And it's good to be back with the family of God again in this space. There are a number of things, a lot of people that we missed, a lot of experiences that we missed. And one of the things that we missed was the Smile Warsaw event last week. I hate to miss that because it's a beautiful experience. And uh, here's some pictures from that. Thank you to Lovely, who shared some of her pictures so we could see what was going on. And that's a, another beautiful experience where we get to express hope and love to people who are having a difficult time, a difficult experience. And I'll be talking today about living a life of love. And Smile Warsaw is a great example of doing that. So I'd like to just say thanks to Derek for organizing these Smile Warsaw events. Uh, thanks for putting in that time and effort, Derek. I appreciate that. And all those who serve as volunteers, you make it happen. That's, that's wonderful that we can bless people uh, through our efforts. And today, we're returning back to a series that we have been in called The Search for Significance where we're asking some deep questions, some existential questions. 
Where do we find the significance of our lives? What's the purpose and meaning of our existence? Some of the first level questions that we don't sometimes think to spend time working on, but they're important things. And we want to know, what does God have to say about that? So in this series, we will discover our significance as it's revealed in the only place that we can truly find it, in God's Word, through the book of Ephesians, which is helping us to do this. And I had previously mentioned uh, earlier in this series that the book of Ephesians in the New Testament is a letter which is written to a church in Ephesus that was planted by the Apostle Paul. And we met the Apostle Paul back when we did our series on the book of Acts. He was powerfully transformed by God from a hateful, destructive enemy of God's people, a persecutor, wonderfully transformed by God to a man who exemplified self-sacrificial love. That kind of transformation is what I want to talk about today. So I've entitled my message, You Are a New Self, Living a Life of Love. And we're going to dig into the fourth chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians and see how we can be transformed by putting off the old self and being made new and putting on a new self. That's what God does. He's in the transformation business. He's good at it. So we read this in Ephesians chapter 4. Paul writes to the people that he loves in the city of Ephesus. You heard about Christ and you were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. There's a lot there. Let's unpack that. See, Paul had told them about Jesus. He shared with them this hope of transformation that he himself had experienced. And certainly he would have shared his story with them, his own story of how Jesus met him on the road to Damascus and started a relationship with him that would last Paul's whole life and that would be the most significant relationship he ever had and ever would have this relationship of love so that Paul would later say, I have lost all things and I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. That was his enthusiasm, his excitement, his joy over this transformation that he experienced in relationship to Jesus. And Paul desires that transformation for all of his friends in Ephesus and for everybody else that he can tell about it. He dedicated his life to traveling around the known world and telling people about this Jesus who can transform your life. And he even shared that with King Agrippa, if you remember this from our uh, study in the book of Acts. He got to stand before the king and he shared his story, that story, with the king and enthusiastically proclaimed this and invited the king to respond and said, you believe the scriptures, King Agrippa, don't you? And the king said, oh, do, you, do you think in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul replied, he said, short time or long, I wish that you and everybody who's listening, and he, he meant everybody else that could be listening, that you could become as I am, except for these chains on my wrists. You can leave that part off. But yes, I do wish that you could become a Christian. And he wished that for everyone, that transformation. So the first thing we notice here is Paul talking about putting off the old self. The first step in the process of transformation. You have to be willing to let go of old things that don't serve us anymore. 
as if our hands are full of the old things that we're not willing to let go of, then we, we can't receive anything new. There's no space. We have to be willing to open our hands and let go of old things. We have to be willing to step out of our old life, our old paradigms, our old ways of thinking and acting in order to embrace the new. So there's a joke about two caterpillars who are walking on a branch and suddenly a butterfly flies by, flapping its wings, soaring up into the sky. One caterpillar says to the other, you'll never catch me going up on one of those things. But that's actually his destiny, if he's willing to embrace it, if he's willing to make a cocoon and go into it and allow the transformative process to occur so that he actually develops wings and then has to bust out of the cocoon, which is a difficult experience, but it's absolutely necessary. That struggle is essential because that builds the strength in the young butterfly to be able to fly when it comes out of the cocoon. And that's what God has for the caterpillar. It's also a similar thing that God has for us. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says this, If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Caterpillars become butterflies. And that old life is what Paul was describing earlier in his letter to the Ephesians, in chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. He said, As for you... You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, the evil one, Satan, the devil. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature. And some folks want to live there for their whole lives. They find that to be satisfying, and they're willing to hold, or they're, they're unwilling to let go. They want to hold on to it. They don't want to let go for fear they won't find anything better. But Paul says, that's not really living. That's actually death. You're actually the walking dead. You're separated from God, from the source of real life. And all of us were, were there at one time separated from God. But God doesn't want to leave us there. God pursues us. He chases us down in merciful pursuit. He sends his good news, his message, his truth to us in many different ways, uh, through people, through uh, media, through just the world that he's made. Creation shouts to us, there is a God, respond to him. And the Bible says that through what he has made, we can know that he exists and that he's good, that he has made a good creation, including us. But we have to let go of the old dead life in order to become new and alive. How do we put off the old dead life? Paul tells us, in the first chapter of Ephesians, he says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. So when we hear the good news, however it comes to us, we hear about God's love for us, demonstrated by Jesus' death for us on the cross, in our place. And when we respond to it by faith, when we receive it, we trust in what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Then we're included in Christ. We are adopted into God's family, the family of God. We're given eternal life, no longer the walking dead. Now we're made alive in Christ. And Paul continues 
Uh, and he says, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And he just exults and celebrates. What a great God. What a great salvation. The old is gone. And that makes room for the new to come. Paul mentions being made new in the attitude of your mind. Now, what does that mean? Paul also talks about this in Romans 12, verse 2. He says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. There's that transformation process. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We just talked about this at City Life last Friday. Being a Christian means being a follower of Jesus. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me and I give them eternal life. So it's about whose voice we listen to and who we follow. So the social media savvy crowd among us says, yeah, just give me his Instagram account and I'll follow him. But it's not that easy. Uh, it's more than just following an Instagram account. It's about a new God-oriented way of looking at life, of thinking. It's a, it's a worldview that's centered on God and his way of doing things. Jesus referred to that as the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God, he talked about it a lot, is the rule and reign of God. It's when we make God our king. We make him our Lord, the Lord of our lives. It's when we really trust him with everything about us and about everything else. And the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. It's not the old way of thinking. It's a new way of God-oriented thinking. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths or he will make your paths straight. So we need to trust God in order to be able to, do, to know and to do his will. That's obvious. But that's another word for that is walking by faith. Right? When we walk by faith we step out in trust. We may not know what's gonna happen in the future. Like when Peter, the, uh, the follower of Jesus, the apostle, stepped out of the boat during a storm because Jesus was out there and he saw that Jesus was able to uphold him, to carry him, to support him even when there was no visible means of support, no guarantee of safety, except for Jesus' presence. But that's what we discover when we walk by faith. We discover that God is faithful. We discover that he is there. We discover that he is trustworthy. And that's what we're discovering in this season of grief as we are experiencing the pain, the sorrow, we are experiencing God's everlasting arms underneath us. We are experiencing being upheld. And we find, when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't need to fear any evil because God is with me. This is real. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is real world stuff. It actually works. And you don't necessarily really understand it or really believe it until you experience it. That's what we're experiencing. So God is good, even as life is hard. It's both and. Then the third thing we notice is that Paul talks about putting on the new self. 
he has told us to put off our old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of our minds. Now, he says, <coughs> excuse me, now he says in Ephesians 4, put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So the new self isn't like the old self, the walking dead, stuck in transgressions and sins. The new self is righteous and holy. What does that mean? What is true righteousness and holiness? Because there are some wrong ideas about what righteousness and holiness is all about. The world looks at those as bad words. We've heard perhaps the, the phrases self-righteous. He's such a stuck-up, self-righteous so-and-so. That's a really bad thing. And we've heard the term, oh, he's so holier than thou. You know, he thinks he's better than everybody else. These are bad terms. And the, that's what the world thinks. These terms are sometimes applied to Christians as if that's what it means to be a Christian, to be self-righteous so-and-so, and to be holier than thou, having your nose stuck up in the air. But true righteousness is not self-righteous. That actually is impossible. You can't be self-righteous. Righteousness does not come through our own strength. It's not from us. It's from God. It's by faith. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 3. He writes, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets, the, the Bible, the Old Testament, testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. That's not self-righteous. That's God-righteous. That's true understanding of what righteousness is. You can't be self-righteous. We can't do it in our own strength. True righteousness is a gift that we receive by faith in Jesus. And righteousness is right relationship with God. It's being made right with God, and he does it. We get right with God by faith in Jesus, not by being good, not by being self-righteous. It's a gift. We don't pay for it. We don't earn it. We receive it. And it's the same thing with holiness. To be holy is to be set apart, to be uniquely set apart from a common to a sacred purpose. To understand that, let's imagine something uh, together. Let's imagine that God is taking a walk one day, and he's walking through a field, and he comes upon a common ordinary egg in the field, just your standard ordinary egg, nothing special. And it's just lying there in the mud because it was laid there by a free-range chicken. And God stoops down and very carefully and gently picks up the egg. And he cleans it. And then he, being the artist, the creator that he is, he decorates it with amazing artwork that only he can do because he's the master artist. And then he puts it in a display case, puts it in a museum where people come from all over the world to look at it and to marvel at God's amazing artwork, more stunning than the most beautiful Fabergé egg, the world-famous Fabergé eggs, which the most expensive Fabergé egg ever that was sold, the Rothschild clock egg, sold for $25.1 million U.S. dollars. That's some egg. And that was just decorated by a human. That's nothing compared to God's design. And we are that egg. God has 
lifted us up out of the mud and has put his own design on us and has set us apart, put us on a display ta table, put us in a display case so people can marvel. We are for the display of his glory. That's you and me. That's our significance. And we are the handiwork of God, as we talked about before. You are a lot more valuable than any Fabergé egg, than all of the Fabergé eggs put together, all of which have sold for millions and millions of dollars. That's holiness. That's what God does for us. He puts us there, out of the common to the sacred, set apart, unique, holy. And so in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 7, God says, I am the Lord your God who makes you holy. It's his work. And in 1 John 1, 8 and 9, it says this, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. It's not about us making ourselves holy. We can't do it. Verse 9, but if we confess our sins, if we just own up to it and say, yes, I'm guilty, I do that, I have done that. If we confess our sins, which just means to agree with God about it, Yes, guilty, Your Honor, guilty as charged. What does he do? He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So you see that up on the screen. It's not about us making ourselves holier than thou. We can't do it. It's about him making us holy. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So our job in this is to confess our sin. God's job in this is to forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. So if I'm purified from all unrighteousness, what am I? Righteous, holy, pure, blameless, perfect. Would you apply those words to yourself? If you believe in Jesus, you can, because that's what he has done. It's not based on what we do. It's not based on our goodness not based on our ability to make ourselves good. We can't. We just have to receive what he has done. He has done it. That's the cure for our sin, past, present, and future. He is the cure. That's the only remedy, not our good works. That's what God says. So when we receive the gift of our righteousness, our holiness from God that Jesus paid for with his own blood. So we don't have to pay for it. And what could we add to what God has done? We can't buy it. We can't purchase it with our goodness. We just have to receive it. And then it's just a matter of living out of what God has already achieved for us. So we live holy lives out of love for God, for the fact that he loved us enough to do this for us, to die for us, to make us holy. So with that understanding, when we get that right, then we can live a life of love. We can live a holy life. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. So we do it out of love, not out of fear that we're going to get in trouble if we don't, not out of guilt that we, oh, no, I did a bad thing. Oh, I feel so bad. Don't want to do that again. No, we do it out of love. This is something I had to learn when I went through a very difficult time, when I had a, a meltdown, an emotional breakdown, and I wasn't able to function for a time back in the year 2000. And 
I came to the end of myself. I came to the end of my strength. And I realized, you know what? I can't do it. And that was the breakthrough. Because God said, that's right. You can't do anything. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so I went to a counselor. And uh, I received some psychological counseling. And one of the great things that he said to me was, you need to stop living on the engine of fear. You need to learn to live on the engine of faith, on the engine of love. Because love is a much more powerful engine than fear. I had been running on fear. I'm like, oh no, I, you know, I, I got to earn my acceptance. I got to make God proud of me. I got to make him happy. I don't want to disappoint him or anybody else. And that exhausted me. And I eventually just ran out of energy, ran out of steam and collapsed. That is exhausting. Then I learned that God just loves me, period. There's nothing I can do to make him love me more. And there's nothing I can do to make him love me less. Because he is love. That's who he is. I can't change him. That's who he is for you. He just loves you. Period. Full stop. And there's nothing you can do about it. You're stuck being loved by God. So you just got to accept it, receive it, and then respond out of love. Oh, God, thank you for loving me, for accepting me, for giving me holiness. So what can I do for you today? Because then I want to. It's not a have to, it's a get to. I get to live a holy life because I don't want to be separated from God. Sin is turning your back on God and walking away from him in the direction of our desires, uh, which Paul says are being corrupted. I don't want that corruption. Repentance is to turn around and to turn towards God. And as soon as we do, no matter how far we've run away from him, when we turn around, he's right there with his arms open, always. And all we have to do is just run into his arms and get that hug, get that love. That's our God. So Paul says in Ephesians 4, here's the response. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And then in Ephesians chapter 5, he says, follow God's example. Another translation says, be imitators of God. As dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. There's no greater love than what Jesus demonstrated for us. So now we get to live a life of love that comes from him and that flows through us so we can pay it forward. And that's what we do in Smile Warsaw. We're just paying it forward, just pouring the love that he pours into us out onto others. That's how the new self lives. And when we live that way, loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, loving our neighbor as ourselves, then the church becomes a taste of heaven. And people are drawn to it. And they say, as they said about the early church, they say, see how they love one another. I think I want to be a part of that community. <laughs> Who wouldn't? Who wouldn't want to be part of a community that really loves, who, who lives like Jesus did, who loves like Jesus did? Everybody wants to be loved and to experience love and to love others. That's what we're called to do and to be. And the world is going to be a better place as, as we do it, as we walk in the way of love. And the kingdom of God will come and his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is our destiny, fellow caterpillars. 
we are destined to fly, to soar up into heaven as we cooperate with God and enter into his transformation process. I like to call the worship team up, and I want to go into a prayer time right now. And I invite you to just do a little business with God right now, just in your own heart. Just invite him to speak and say, Lord, is there anything that I need to submit to you for your transformation? Is there anything between you and I? Is there any sin that I'm still clinging to? Is there anything I'm unwilling to open my hands about and, and let you have and trust to your care? Is there any fears that I'm holding on to that I'm not trusting you for? Speak, Lord, your servants are listening. Lord Jesus, meet with us in this holy space. You said, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So we just open our hearts to you like a flower opens up to the sunlight and the rain, the both and, where we meet you. When life is hard, still you are good. So we lift up our hurts to you. We lift up our sorrow. We lift up our loneliness. We lift up our fear. We also lift up a sacrifice of praise, thanking you that you are able to take all these things and to hold them. That you are trustworthy, that you will meet us in our weakness. In fact, when we are weak, then your strength is most obviously on display. So meet with us, God, and carry us on. Lord, we're weak. We need you. Be Jehovah Jireh to us, God, the God who provides. Be Jehovah Rapha to us, the God who heals. Be who you are, God. You are love. Pour your love into my heart by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And fill us by your Spirit so that we can overflow into the lives of others and give away give away what you've given to us. God, you can do exceedingly beyond all we can ask or even imagine. So, yeah, we're just going to enter into a time of worship now and lifting up this sacrifice of praise. Yeah. Amen.